Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 71, we're going to take another look at how to achieve great sound, part four. In fact, we're going to look at this little guy right here. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Last week we had a look at what components the signal passes through in a pure Class A preamp. This week we're going to finish up our look at the preamp by focusing in on the one component every audio system has to have somewhere. Yep, you guessed it, the volume potentiometer or more commonly called the pot. <laughs> now, these volume pots come in a huge number of types and configurations. They can be as simple as a resistive track and a wiper, like this Alps, to the same basic pot with a remote controlled motor attached, to stepped pots that might have 23 resistors mounted to a complicated switch, or they might even be a digital, a digital switched pot. Now I use the Alps pot exclusively in my prototype builds and in my kit amps because they are very low noise, they're affordable, they sound great, and most importantly they're reliable. Now if you've been around audio, particularly vintage audio, for any length of time, you know that if you've got a scratchy noisy problem in your system, it's very likely this little bugger. Well, not the Alps, but <laughs> whatever the pot is you've got in your system is most likely causing the problem, though not always. Tubes can cause a lot of the same kinds of noises as volume pots can. So, when I say they sound great, what do I mean? I mean they all they do is they pass a good pot just passes the audio signal, the low voltage, through, controls the level with a volume control, and doesn't do anything else. It doesn't add noise, it doesn't color the sound, it doesn't fool around with the phase, it just basically handles the control of the volume. Okay, now how do these things work? Well, let's, every one of these things is going to have a spec on it. So the Alps, let's get it up close to the camera, says that it's a 100, 100K times 2. So 100K is 100K ohms or kilo ohms. That's 100,000 ohms of resistance, which sounds like a lot, and it is. Times 2 means that there's actually two pots or volume controls inside one case. So this is a stereo volume control. Mono is probably a more common type. If you have, let's say, a guitar amp, you're probably going to have a mono volume control. So we're going to have a wafer or card in front for a stereo pot and one behind it that are identical. On that wafer, we're going to have a resistive track and connected to the volume control knob, we're going to have a wiper on each one of the channels, right? So as you go from zero volume up, your resistance is going to go down. And it's just easy to illustrate this, I think, with a volt ohm meter. Let's do that. Hang on a second. Let's get set up. It's just going to take me a minute. That's one of the beauties of filming on my bench, is that there's, there's always gear at the ready. Okay, let me just see if I can get this where you can see it. Let's just clip on. Well, look at that, we're bang on. You see that? 100K. So that's just perfect. We're at zero now. Let's start turning the volume up and see what happens. See how the resistance is going down? 
It's going down fairly slowly at first. That's because this is an audio taper and it's not a linear volume control. And the reason why they do that is because we don't hear sound or perceive sound in a linear manner. So what they did was they came up with a, um, a taper for the volume controls that matches more closely to how we actually perceive sound. Neat, huh? So as we turn up the volume, the taper is going to accelerate. See how the resistance is dropping rapidly now? And it's all the way down to zero, well, let's call it one ohm, right? Essentially it's at zero. One ohm is almost no resistance whatsoever. So that is full volume. That's going to be our lowest resistance. Okay, I hope that helped to understand how volume pots work. Let's get this stuff out of the road. Now, why am I even talking about volume pots? Well, last week I talked about the importance of good design, short signal pass, good quality components, and wire, and hardware, because tube sockets matter as well. The RCA jacks matter a lot because you're plugging in and out of them. All of that's important, but the sound has to go through this mechanical device. It has to pass through somewhere in your system. If you were to put in a cheap pot, and that's a very common thing, and sort of, you know, almost good equipment, they don't want to spend the money on even an Alps. And as a result, you're compromised. You're compromised right at the volume control. Now, you could spend a lot more money than the Alps. You could spend a hundred times the price of the Alps and get a really high-end volume control, and you could double the price of your preamp. <laughs> Would you double the quality of the sound? No, you wouldn't even come close, because the Alps is already a good quality pot. Okay, so one of the things I really wanted to get across is what is the amplifier? In this case, we're looking at a simple Class A preamplifier. And for expedience, we're not showing the resistors. The, all the resistors do is basically set the operating point of the tubes. They do a few other little jobs, but that's basically it. This is the signal path right here that you're looking at. We're missing some bits and pieces of wire and some tube sockets, but so what? This is basically the signal path. A nice, simple one with good quality components. So where is the amplifier? Is it the power supply? Is it the capacitors? It's the tubes. In fact, if you have any piece of tube gear, a phono preamp, a line control preamp like we're talking about here, a power amp, a monoblock, it doesn't matter. The tubes are the amplifier. Everything else facilitates allowing the tubes to work at their designated operating point to set them at their operating point and to power them up. But the tubes are the amplifier. <laughs> okay, hopefully everybody got that. Now, what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, work continues on a whole bunch of prototypes, all at the same time, of course. And my partner Charles is almost finished setting up our CNC machine, which will make manufacturing the top plates a whole lot easier and quicker. And, hang on a second, I got a top plate here somewhere. Let me grab it. Now this is my simplest top plate. Let's back up so you can see the whole thing. This is for the wee little Yuri monoblock. And this is actually the foundation of a great sounding monoblock. It is a good solid top plate. It's 3 16 aluminum. I forget what the metric equivalent is. Sorry, folks. Um, I'm usually pretty good at looking up equivalents. Um, but, and it actually doesn't look like it's that hard to mill by hand. And it's not. It's not that bad, actually. But, things like these um, 
these ventilation holes and access points. These are access points for um, there's top plate connections on there's three top plate connections in total on the two tubes that are in the URI and I like having ventilation of the components even on an amp like this that doesn't get that hot in fact the trans power transformer sits up on top right here I think but this gives easy access for the wires to come through as well and I think it adds a little bit of design element so it does a lot of things all at once but being able to mill these out with a computer controlled machine will give us a little bit tighter tolerances but more importantly it'll free me up to do other things than making you know plates for prototypes anyways let's get that out of the road and we've also got a test builder who's nearing completion on his E80CC kit preamp. Now that's going to be the second test builder to finish. I think it's the second. Um, and he's hit a problem at the very end. But I'm certain we'll figure it out without too much trouble. It's going to be normal. If you don't normally, if you've never built a piece of audio equipment, um, if this is new to you, you can easily expect that you're going to hit a snag. But the good news is we have we have the prototype data, so we have all the voltages of the preamp. Hang on a second, let me go grab the spec sheet. Here we go. You can see after I finalized the design and finalized the prototype, I actually marked down, now on all the schematics I marked down four builders, I marked down the voltages. So here's what the plate voltage should be. Here's actually the beginning, the B plus should be the plate voltage. This is the cathode bias voltage that sets the operating point through this resistor. Well, the, the plate, the tube, and the cathode resistor and the voltage all set the operating point. But essentially we look at this, the cathode resistor, as being the key component to get us down to 2.7 volts. And we look here also at the voltage on our cathode follower stage. Anyways, finding, once you know what to do, finding mistakes in a build is actually quite easy. But for a new builder, it's a learning experience. And you will, I guarantee, that if you have to troubleshoot your amp, you'll have a much better understanding when you're done troubleshooting than when you started. And you'll have a great sounding amp at the end of the day. Okay, let's put that aside. Okay, what came in this week? Well, I've been catching up on some tube testing. Let me grab some. Now... This is the number 80. This is a true vintage box. I love the RCA boxes. In fact, if you follow my channel, you know that one of my favorite things is vintage boxes. Um, I mean, I love the tubes, but the boxes are fun. Let's just open this up carefully. They get, boxes get brittle. They get a little worn. You can only open them so many times. Oh, look at that. You see how it's stored? Most vintage boxes are far superior to modern boxes. Don't ask me why. It's just the way it is. See that? Isn't that cool? It's a cone. So the tube just drops in, nestles in there. And this is a number 80 rectifier tube. It's a four-pin tube. And it's basically two tubes inside one envelope. In fact... It is the um, the earlier version of this tube was the first dual um, rectifier tube that was ever made, and there's there this is the generic number became the number eighty, but there must be like I don't know two dozen different numbers that all essentially mean this tube. This is a very common tube back in the day. Let's grab the spec sheet for fun. We're not going to spend too much time on it. 
RCA invented the tube, and here it tells us that it's a full wave rectifier. And let's just look at some of the specs down here, just for fun. It takes five voltages, <laughs> five volts uh, AC to heat it. That's very common for rectifiers. And down here, we want to know how much current it can handle and how much voltage it can handle. So it's maximum plate voltage looks like it's 440. I'm reading upside down, so I, I can't get it exactly, exactly right. And its maximum current capability is 135 milliamps, which for the time that this tube was made was, you know, um, was fabulous. <laughs> so it was a very popular tube. So remember that roughly half a kilovolt and 135 milliamps max, right? Now, and let's put this away before, and a whole bunch of these came in. Some new old stock, um, some um, used, and um, if you're into vintage um, equipment, you're probably going to want to keep some 80s around. And... We'll fiddle with that later. Have a look at this, though. Here is a modern rectifier. It's a semiconductor. This is the UF4007. UF just stands for ultra fast. And two of these can do what? one tube, one big tube could do in the past, and four of these make a full bridge. And you can't, you couldn't make a full bridge, but you could with, with two of those full wave tubes, but it's not that practical. So it's not how uh, we, you would design a traditional power supply. You'd use a center tap, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's for another, another day, another episode. So these have a rating of 1,000 volts, one kilovolt, so twice as much voltage as the number 80, and they can handle up to a full amp. So quite a bit more amperage than the number 80. Have a look at these. These are BY228s, and these are sintered glass rectifiers, and they go up to 1.5 kilovolts. Let me get it up close so you can see one. Three amps. So roughly three, three times the current capabilities of the little guy. And you can see that there's a fairly substantial difference in size. These cost, I don't remember what I pay for these anymore, uh, but I, let's just say they cost 10 cents and these may be 20 cents. I think that's more than I pay for them, but I forget. Um, but that tells you why, in a hurry, new equipment, other than um, guitar amps and things like that, that rely on the sagging effects of the rectifier to contribute to the overall sound signature. But with um, audio equipment, the preference, generally speaking, is to build solid state power supplies with these devices because we don't want any sag and uh, fr frankly in my opinion anyways uh, these will sound better they'll be faster they'll be cleaner sounding they'll be more reliable and they're a hell of a lot cheaper and they take up a lot less real estate <laughs> okay well if you stayed all the way till the end Here's some discount codes to help you out. This is the last weekend of the Mullard, the Yale 34 Mullard sale. It's been going great. A lot of you have been taking advantage of $100 off. I know they're an expensive set of tubes and not everybody can afford them, but work your way up to them because if you're into the Yale 34 sound, and who isn't that loves tube sound um, or tube amps, the Mullards 
you can't beat the Mullards. You can get close on various aspects of the Mullards and maybe even come close to beating them. The RFT it probably beats the Mullards on detail, not on warmth. The Svetlana comes very close to the Mullards on warmth. <laughs> but nothing equals the combined effect of the Mullards. And of course, that's because Phillips and Mullard invented the tube. They did the most research on it. They had the best manufacturing capability. So it's not surprising that by the time the second series, the XF2, were made, that they had perfected the formula. So I have flat rate shipping at $20 around the world. And if your orders, you can't see it, but if your orders $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. And of course, all the standard discount codes all apply including one that most of you don't know exists. It's the secret code, but you can figure it out if you try hard enough. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>